This morning's message is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. And it's about the cost of following Jesus. So hear these words. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow him. The man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, listen to me, he says, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus told him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. May God add his blessings to this word. This morning's message is entitled, The Forward Look. Going forward. Looking forward, the forward look. You see, one secret to being successful in the world is to learn how to motivate yourself as well as others. In fact, there's a story of an old tough cowboy who was constantly his grandson that if, if he wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a little gunpowder on his old meal every day. The grandson did this, and he lived to be 93. Go figure. But when he died, he left 14 children, 28 grandchildren, 35 great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot hole in the ceiling of the funeral. <laughs> I don't think we need the gunpowder. Jesus had that difficulty with his disciples. There are many books on Jesus' leadership principles because he was a master, a master leader and a master motivator. In our lesson from Luke's Gospel for today, Jesus says to a certain man, follow me. Then the man said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, it's kind of astonishing how Jesus replied to him. He said, in rather forceful words, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Can you imagine how astonished that man must have been. And then the other man said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. To which Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. What do you suppose he meant by that? You see, Jesus expected his disciples to be totally committed. Totally committed. They could not straddle the fence. They could not hold on to the past at the expense of the present. You see, he wanted them to focus on the future. No one who puts a hand to the plow while looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I say that many times because it's hard to grasp what Jesus meant there. Some people are not able to enjoy the present or prepare for tomorrow because they are still living in the past. In fact, Dr. Warren Wearsby has put it like this, and I quote, Do not say, why were the former days better than these? You do not move ahead by constantly looking in a rear view mirror. <coughs> the past, you see, is a rudder to guide you, not an anchor to drag you down. We must learn from the past 
but not live in the past. Or as Tom Holcroft, a noted author, once said, the past is a guidepost, not a hitching post. Noted preacher John Claypool tells about a thunderstorm that swept through southern Kentucky at a farm where his forebears had lived for six generations. In the orchard, the wind blew over an old pear tree that had been there as long as anybody could remember. Playful's grandfather was saddened to lose the tree on which he had climbed as a boy and whose fruit had, he had eaten all of his life. A neighbor came by and said, Hey, Doc, I'm really sorry to see your pear tree blown down. I'm sorry too, said his grandfather. It was a real part of my past. What are you going to do with the neighbor asked? His grandfather paused for a moment and then said, I'm going to pick the fruit and burn what's left. That is the wise way to deal with many things in our past. We need to learn their lessons, enjoy their pleasures, and then go on with the present. Absolutely wise outlook on life. But there are some people who can never let go of past experiences and thus they are handicapped in dealing with the present and the future. William Good, in his book God Laughs Too, tells a hilarious story that he heard from a, from a seminary president. At this president's seminary, when the candidates are ordained into the ministry, they have one thing to do in the service. At the conclusion of the worship, the candidates stand, stand up, walk up the steps into the chancel area. That's this area right up in here. Then they turn and give their benediction. That is their first official act as an ordained pastor. One candidate stood, approached the step, and ascended the steps. But on the first step, he got tangled up inside the hem of his robe. Now, it would seem that the obvious thing to do would be to step back out of the robe, but he didn't do that. <laughs> the poor candidate kept climbing the steps, all the time walking up the inside of his robe. Each step made him smaller as he was forced to duck walk up the inside of his robe. Finally, at the top of the steps, looking like nothing more than a dwarf in a white tent, he turned around. His robe couldn't turn with him since he was standing inside it. Turning his body, placed his left arm of his robe right in the center of his chest and the right arm between his shoulders. All he could do, all he could move was his wrist, which he waved as he gave the benediction. When he was all, all done, two ushers came forward, picked him up by the arms and carried him off like a piece of furniture. Now the image of that poor seminary student trying to maintain his dignity while being hobbled by his robe reminds me of people who go through life hobbled by their past. Is there anyone in this room who remembers the Great Depression? Is there anyone in the room whose parents went through the Depression? Have you noticed that people who went through the Depression are much more conservative with their money than people who were born after the Depression? Pastor Kent Crockett tells about a man who has always been thankful for his shoes. You see, when Crockett asked him why, the man replied, when I was a boy during the Depression, my parents couldn't afford to buy new shoes. So I would put cardboard in my shoe, shoe bottoms whenever they got holes. And when I walked through the rain and snow, I had to keep replacing the cardboard. I've always been thankful shoes because I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten.
forgotten wearing little shoes. We will think of times when we did without, says Crockett. We'll become thankful for what we have. That's why God told the children of Israel to remember how he brought them out of the house of slavery. It's found in Deuteronomy 8. He wanted that experience to be a reference point in their minds for thankfulness. How many of you have those reference points in your life? In that particular case, remembering the past was beneficial. It fostered a spirit of gratitude. But that's not always true. Listen to this story. He goes on to tell about a woman he knew with a history of rejection who was always suspicious of others' motives. Friend once complimented her by saying, You look nice today. <laughs> and the woman replied, Are you saying that I don't look nice every day? <laughs> you said that I look nice today. Does that mean that you think I don't look good on other days? Her puzzled friend said, No, I didn't mean that. I just think your dress looks nice. I didn't mean that. And before she could finish, she said, Well, I don't know how to take it any other way. You think I look bad most of the time, don't you? Because of her twisted perspective based on her past experiences, this woman turned in a compliment to do an insult. How awesome do we do that? You don't have to hold up your hand, but, but has anyone here ever been unlucky in love? <laughs> have you ever been rejected? Embarrassed, humiliated. Does it color how you approach life today? There are people who carry around a deep sense of rejection because they can't let go of the past. There are marriages that are suffering because one partner or another can't let go of the past. There are people sabotaging their future because their lives are so deeply affected by an incident or a series of incidents in their past. Psychotherapist Pat Pearson had a client named Susan. She was a gifted woman who achieved success early in her career. For a woman who was raised in near poverty, this was quite an accomplishment. At first, Susan's family and friends were supportive of her career. Soon they began to make snide comments about how Susan was getting too fancy, too big for her riches. She wasn't like them anymore. Who did she think she was? And so Susan began unconsciously sabotaging her own success. Her income and her achievements shrank. Susan knew that she could be more successful, but she was uncomfortable with the image of herself as a successful person. So she deliberately downgraded her efforts. Psychologists tell us that this is not uncommon. Our past can so color our perceptions of reality that we are not able to profit from the present or prepare for the future. You see, fixation on the past is a perennial problem in the church. Not just this church, not just this denomination, but churches everywhere in the United States. There are churches all over our land where church growth experts tell us that are dying because they can't let go of the past. You remember those seven last words of the church? We've never gone that way before. That's why in many denominations the emphasis is upon starting new congregations rather than trying to revive old congregations. How many church closings were announced at the conference this year? Quite a few. Quite a few. There have been 11 in Michigan in the last two years. 
Most of them are because of declining membership. Because they were living in the past and not responding to the future. You see, people have a certain picture in their minds of what church ought to be. It is a picture usually of the church of their youth. So the ideal church for many people is a church that by its very nature is geared to the needs of a previous generation rather than the needs of the present generation. Dealing with the past has always been a tricky proposition for religious people. In fact, there's a story told about a devout Christian who was faithful in his daily devotions. He read portions of scripture and a devotional book meditated silently for a while and then prayed. As time went by, his prayers became longer and more intense. He came to cherish his quiet time with God. In fact, his, his cat liked his devotional time too. She came, she snuggled up against her owner and purred loudly. This interrupted the man, so he put a collar around the cat's neck and tied her to the bedpost whenever he wanted to be left alone. The man's daughter noticed how much his devotional time meant to him and she adopted the same practice. She dutifully tied her cat to the bedpost and proceeded to read and pray. But her prayer time was shorter. The day came when her son grew up. He wanted to keep some of the family traditions, but the, the pace of his life had quickened, quickened greatly in his generation. He felt that he had no time for elaborate devotion, so he eliminated the time for meditation, Bible reading, and prayer. So in order to carry out the family's religious tradition while dressing each morning, he just tied the cat to the bedpost. Now there's a warning here. We cherish many good things in our past. But we want to make certain that we're not just simply trying to cat to the dead. Every church needs to continually evaluate itself to see if it's meeting the needs of the present generation. Those are the people our Lord has called us to serve. In fact, Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus has called us to be forward-looking people, forward-looking churches. I wonder if there's anyone here today who needs to let go of something in their past. A time when you were betrayed or humiliated or demon hurt. Is some past traumatic experience keeping you from enjoying the present? Sometimes even good experiences can hinder us. Are you evaluating your present family situation? For example, on the basis of how things were when you were a child. Maybe your parents kept their conflicts and disagreements carefully hidden, and so you went into your marriage with an unrealistic expectation what marriage is supposed to be compared to your parents' marriage. Your relationship with your spouse doesn't measure up. Is that where you are at? There are an infinite number of ways that the past can affect our perceptions of our lives today. We need to give thanks for the experiences in our lives that have brought us to this point. Don't let them interfere with the present. The final story I want to share happened in September 1944. A U.S. bomber plane flying over the Pacific was hit by enemy fire. The three airmen on board must make a hasty parachute jump to safety. Only one of the three survives the terrifying 
This lone survivor, George Bush, would later distinguish himself in business and in politics and would go on to become our country's 41st president. In fact, he went on to father another president of our United States. Yet 53 years after that terrible bailout over the Pacific, former President George Bush decided that he needed to tackle that parachute jump once again. According to a story in Life magazine, he wasn't looking for, for glory or publicity. He simply wanted to face the awful memories and emotions associated with this wartime incident. So at the age of 72, George Bush hired a plane to fly him over the Arizona desert where he made a successful parachute jump. Now, after all those years, he could put that part of his past to rest. I share this because sometimes we need to do something just about that radical. To get rid of painful memories that are interfering with present happiness. Of course, that's what our faith is about, isn't it? It's not about life in the past. It's about living joyfully and freely in the present. Remember what Jesus said. No man can push his hand to the fire and looks back is fit to the kingdom of God. So, which way are you looking? Are you stuck in the muck from the past? Or are you going forward? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. And we have to